Aloha, everyone. My name is Crystal Ka'ai, and I serve as the Executive Director of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, or what we call WeonP. And I will be serving as your MC today. Thank you so much for tuning in to our program. We are excited to announce today's launch and release of the Biden-Harris administration's inaugural WeonP report and 32 AA and NHPI federal agency action plans which showcase the breadth of policies, programs, and outreach efforts that the federal government has committed to support our whole of government efforts to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. This work is being done in line with the broad mandates outlined in President Biden's Executive Order 14031, our inaugural report to the president and public release of this federal agency action plans are deeply aligned with the Biden-Harris administration's unprecedented efforts to advance racial equity throughout the entirety of the federal government. Today's launch of the Biden-Harris administration's federal agency action plans and our report represents an important first step in what will be ongoing coordination across the federal government to address both immediate challenges and systemic inequities impacting our communities. Next, we will hear special remarks from our dedicated WIAMPI co-chairs, U.S. Trade Representative Ambassador Catherine Tai and U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Secretary Javier Becerra. Hello, everyone. I'm excited to join you virtually today with my WIAMPI co-chair, Secretary Becerra. From day one, President Biden made clear his commitment to advancing equity for historically underserved and marginalized people, including AA and NHPI communities. The president reestablished the White House Initiative and President's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, both of which I am proud to co-chair with Secretary Becerra. Since then, we have stepped up our efforts to ensure that we hear directly from AA and NHPI communities on the challenges they face and that we advance inclusive policies to address those challenges. For example, through the American Rescue Plan, our administration provided direct relief to communities that were disproportionately affected by the pandemic. In May 2021, President Biden signed the historic COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act into law, which provides critical resources to state and local officials to combat vicious attacks against AA and NHPI people. Across the Biden-Harris administration, agencies are advancing equity and grant-making and providing expanded access for communities with limited English proficiency. With today's release of 32 agency action plans, we are building on this progress and detailing specific commitments over the next two years to advance justice and opportunity for AA and NHPI communities. These commitments are bold, ambitious, and attainable, and they will help drive this administration's national strategy to advance racial equity. Let me share how this looks from where I sit as the United States Trade Representative. As much as this job takes me abroad to meet with my foreign counterparts, I have made a point to visit with community leaders around the country and hear their perspectives. Whether it's students or farmers in Charlotte or Chicago, we discuss our collective resilience and the reality that their leadership underpins any policy solution we advance. When I talk about inclusive, worker centered trade policy, it means bringing perspectives to the table of those who have historically been excluded from the policymaking process. That means taking meetings and telling stories, but it also means insisting that we study and take into account how policies made in Washington affect our communities. We are doing that for trade policy, and we can do it across government. By changing who is at the table and whose experience matters, we will deliver on our promises now and for decades to come. I'd like to conclude by thanking the dedicated public servants who contributed to the Interagency Working Group Report and Action Plans. I would also like to lift up the entire WIANPI team, including our Executive Director, Crystal Ka'ai. Crystal's leadership and vision are instrumental in WIANPI's success, and we are so fortunate to have her coordinating this historic whole-of-government effort. The WIANPI report and action plans are the result of partnership, dedication, and commitment to realize the dream of a more perfect union. Together, we can show how government can be a force for good in the lives of everyday people, including AA and NHPI communities. 
Thank you for joining us. And like all of you, I look forward to seeing these exciting solutions take effect. Good afternoon. Thank you to everyone who's virtually tuning in. Let me also thank my co-chair of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, Ambassador Catherine Tai, our U.S. Trade Representative. And of course, a big shout out to Weampi's Executive Director, Crystal Kai, to Deputy Assistant to the President and AA and NHPI Senior Liaison, Erica Moritsugu, my fellow cabinet members, and of course, the people of the federal agencies who made today's launch of the National Strategy to Advance Equity, Justice, and Opportunity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities a reality. For too long, systemic barriers have put the American dream out of reach for many Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And racism and xenophobia against AA and NHPI communities continue to threaten the safety and dignity of countless families. But now we have a choice. We can choose to stand for equity, justice, and opportunity, and not the status quo. At the Biden-Harris administration, we have chosen to move forward together, and we have chosen to stand with our AA and NHPI brothers and sisters. And what happens when we stand? We launch a new national strategy to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AA and NHPI communities. Today, the White House Initiative on AA and NHPIs is publishing our inaugural national strategy. This report includes equity action plans prepared by 32 federal agencies that focus on strategic priority areas that are of utmost importance to AA and NHPI communities. Action plans, which along with Riompi's annual report, represent a historic first for the federal government and mark a milestone in our work to invest in communities that too often have been forgotten. Action plans which promote language access and strengthen COVID-19 response and recovery to reach our AA and NHPI families. And action plans which outline priorities for key agencies like the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Justice to combat anti-Asian hate. Since January 2021, President Biden and Vice President Harris have made clear their commitment to prioritizing the needs of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander families. And as Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, I have been honored to oversee a department that over the last year has made great strides to advance health equity, prioritize mental health resources, and reduce disparities in AA and NHPI communities. With the release of today's national strategy, we can bear witness to the Biden-Harris administration's whole-of-government approach in action to advance equity and address the challenges that AA and NHPI communities face. So, my ask of all of you is simple. Be our partners. Continue to stand with us. Let's build on this momentum together. Our sisters and brothers in the AA and NHPI communities chose to stand. And so today, we are charting a new course rooted in equity, justice, and opportunity. Thank you all very much. Now let's go to work. Hi, I'm Daniel Day Kim, and I'm a proud member of President Biden's Advisory Commission on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Today signifies a historic commitment across government to advancing equity, justice, and opportunity for our communities. Thank you to the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders for hosting this important event to launch Weampi's inaugural report and 32 federal agency action plans. Now, over the last few years of the pandemic, we have seen a disturbing uptick in violence and hate disproportionately affecting Asian American women and elders. From Atlanta, to New York City, to Dallas, to San Francisco, our communities have experienced pain and trauma with lasting mental health impacts, including depression and anxiety. But history has also taught us how resilient and strong our communities are and how the richness of our stories and lived experiences make up the very fabric of America. From the Chinese laborers who built our first transcontinental railroad to the veterans who bravely served our nation during World War II, to the healthcare workers who served on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. I personally know the important role the federal government plays in our everyday lives in advancing equity, justice, and opportunity for our diverse communities. And WeAlpi's whole of government approach gives our community access to resources, programs, 
funding, and much needed support as our nation continues to recover from the health and economic impacts of the pandemic. Now, I've never seen our community come together the way it has over the past few years. And I've been so heartened by the support of this administration that has gone beyond the usual political rhetoric. So I look forward to continuing to work alongside the Biden-Harris administration to advance opportunities for the AA and NHPI communities across the country. And we're counting on all of you to do your part in making sure that the federal government works for all of us by reading this report and sending in your ideas and feedback. I'm a strong believer that our government works best when everyone is able to participate in it. So thank you again for tuning in today. And I look forward to our continued work together. Thank you. It's an honor to join you and so many cabinet colleagues today. Thanks to the leadership of President Biden and the White House Initiative, we're making an historic effort across the government to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders through bold and concrete action plans. This work couldn't come soon enough. Together, Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities represent the fastest growing ethnic group in our nation. But for far too long, inequities that harm these communities have gone unrecognized and unchallenged. We see it in sweeping stereotypes that fail to reflect the diversity and nuance within your beautiful communities. We see it in the lack of representation or demeaning portrayals in our media and culture. We see it in casual racism nativism, and xenophobia that aims to call into question your very identity and belonging as Americans. Tragically, we also see it in the appalling violence and threats to safety. And for too many, these problems get dismissed and delegitimized under the cover of a harmful model minority myth. Equity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders has to start with reality, the authentic voices and experiences of these communities. That's what guides us at the Department of Education. We're taking three types of actions. I like to think of them as the three E's. First, enlighten. Enlighten ourselves and inform our policies by focusing on the data and disaggregating it so that we can shed light and address the educational disparities across these diverse communities. Second, engage. We're going to step up our direct engagement with Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities so we can understand their unique educational needs and how we can best support them. And third, empower. Many inclusive institutions lack the funding and resources they need to fully support underserved students. We're building up their capacity to effectively compete for crucial grants and breaking down process barriers within the department that stand in the way of success. Already, over $5 billion from the American Rescue Plan have gone to institutions serving Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. But there is so much more to do. So today, we honor your contributions. We lift up your voices and we commit to raising the bar for building a more equitable future. Thank you. Hi, I'm Secretary Pete Buttigieg, and I'm pleased to share a few words about the work that we're doing at the Department of Transportation as part of the White House Initiative on Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Throughout history, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders have had important and unique relationships with and contributions to transportation. Nearly 4,000 years ago, the ancestors of Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders crossed the world's largest ocean to settle Polynesia with little more than the stars to guide them, millennia before the mapping of the Pacific or even the invention of the compass. In the 19th century, Chinese laborers were critical to constructing America's first transcontinental railroad, often working the most dangerous jobs and at the lowest wages, completing a project that ushered in a new era in our young nation's history. And for the past century, so many immigrant stories have begun with the families fateful decision to board a ship or an airplane seeking that same prosperity and opportunity that has brought countless new Americans to our shores. 
Over the years, this department itself has benefited enormously from the perspectives and insights of AANHPI public servants and leaders. That includes the late Norman Mineta, America's first East Asian cabinet secretary, who spent his childhood in a Japanese internment camp and devoted his adult life to serving his country in uniform, in Congress, and as Secretary of Transportation. Secretary Mineta passed away earlier this year, but our department continues to bear his influence. And today, we're proud to release our AA NHPI Action Plan, which outlines how we'll be taking action to prevent anti-Asian hate, create economic opportunity, and promote diversity in our federal workforce. That work is already underway. We kicked off a national series of listening sessions with a conversation in New York, meeting with local community members to discuss the rise of anti-Asian hate on public transportation. Everyone, everywhere, should be able to get on a bus or step onto a subway car free from the fear of harassment or violence. And we're going to be taking this series on the road to be hearing about transit riders around the country. This work can and must center the voices of AA and NHPI communities themselves. So over the next few months, we'll be implementing more of our plan, from hosting community engagement sessions on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, to providing technical assistance directly to small businesses. And along the way, we'll continue working to find new opportunities to recruit, retain, and support our AA and NHPI employees. Our goal is to create a transportation system that truly serves everyone and empowers every community to access the jobs, resources, and opportunities that we all count on in order to thrive. There are few things more essential in a society than the ability to move freely, fairly, and safely through your community. At the Department of Transportation, we will continue our work every day to secure this for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal and the Wianfi team, as well as my cabinet colleagues for their leadership and partnership. I'm SBA Administrator Isabella Casillas Guzman, the voice on President Biden's cabinet for America's 33 million small businesses and innovative startups. At the SBA, we are working to deliver on the president's vision to build an economy that works for everyone. Small businesses are key to that vision, and the SBA is the agency responsible for helping ensure all of our nation's entrepreneurs including more than 2.6 million AANHPI small businesses can start, grow, and be resilient as they help ensure our economy has competition and innovation. We know that people of color and women are starting businesses at the highest rate. This is why equity is so vital to our work at the SBA. We need to break barriers so all of our entrepreneurs can help us build our infrastructure, make it in America, innovate, and create our clean energy economy, thanks to the president's economic agenda. The Biden-Harris administration and the SBA have made incredible strides in the last nearly two years with expanded networks and partnerships, stronger language and cultural accessibility, policies that focus on underserved and the smallest of the small businesses. And the SBA has delivered billions of dollars to our AANHPI business owners in lending, investments, and COVID relief program, as well as hundreds of hours of advisory services. We have a comprehensive plan going forward, centered on delivering against four equity pillars. First, businesses need capital to grow. We continue to expand our distribution network across our investment and lending program and we simplify our products for our partners and borrowers. Second, businesses need strong balance sheets. We are helping them increase revenue opportunities through e-commerce, trade, and federal contracting, including working with all 24 federal contracting agencies to build on last year's procurement achievements and hit the president's goal by 2025 of giving 15% of the federal spend to small disadvantaged businesses. And third, SBA is expanding our team of advisors and small business centers, focusing on underserved entrepreneurs, including our new community navigator hubs focused on AANHPI communities to expand that cultural and language capacity and meet businesses where they are. You know, finally, SBA is expanding its recovery and resilience focus in response to natural disasters, 
and disruptions to businesses. So we can help all those communities recover from the impacts of climate change. We couldn't do all of this without so many of you. Thank you for the great work and advocacy on behalf of the AANHPI entrepreneurs and communities. I look forward to continuing our work together at the SBA. Thank you to Commissioner Daniel Day Kim, Education Secretary Cardona, Transportation Secretary Buttigieg, and Small Business Administrator Guzman. We are so grateful for your steadfast leadership and commitment to the implementation of this whole of government action plan to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AA and NHPI communities. I will now turn it over to my colleague, Erica Moritsugu, Deputy Assistant to the President and White House AA and NHPI Senior Liaison, who will be moderating our next conversation to highlight the important work that the White House and federal agencies are undertaking to move forward key priorities for our communities. Mahalo, Crystal, for the kind introduction and for your excellent leadership of the initiative. Aloha, everyone. Thank you for everyone for making this event possible and to each of you across the country for virtually tuning in today and joining us for today's discussion with two of my most esteemed colleagues here in the Biden-Harris White House. I'm honored to be the first person to fill this role of Deputy Assistant to the President and AAN and HPI Senior Liaison at the White House. And I work closely with the White House Initiative on AAN and HPIs and across government on our whole of government approach to advancing equity justice and opportunity for all Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander individuals, families, and communities. As part of these efforts, earlier this year, the initiative launched a federal interagency working group. It includes senior officials and subject matter experts from 45 agencies and offices working closely together to coordinate policies and programs and increase outreach to underserved AA and NHPI communities. These agencies are advancing policies to improve data disaggregation efforts, address anti-Asian hate and bias, especially in the AA and NHPI communities, and cultivate a federal workforce that reflects the rich diversity of our country. It's now my honor to introduce our special guest for this panel on our whole of government effort. We're honored to have Nani Coloretti join us today. In March of this year, Nani was confirmed as Deputy Director of the U.S. Office of Management and Budget, or OMB. As the largest office within the office of the president, OMB is tasked with overseeing the implementation of President Biden's vision across the executive branch. It produces the president's budget, examines agency programs, policies, and procedures, and coordinates interagency policy initiatives. We're also honored to have Sharag Baines with us today. He is the deputy assistant to the president for racial justice and equity at the Domestic Policy Council. The Domestic Policy Council drives the development and implementation of the president's domestic policy agenda in the White House and across the federal government, ensuring that domestic policy decisions and programs are consistent with the president's priorities and are carried out for the American people. This includes today's launch of our national strategy to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islander communities. Thank you for joining us today, Deputy Director Coloretti and Deputy Trog Bain. We are well, we are thrilled to engage with and learn from you. Deputy Director Coloretti, may I start with you? Of course, Erica, aloha to hello. you and to everyone. Hello. So, Deputy Director, data disaggregation is a crucial issue for our communities. The President's Advisory Commission on AA and HPI submitted several recommendations to the President to expand data disaggregation across the federal government. And over a dozen federal agencies have committed to prioritize efforts to further disaggregate AA and NHPI data. I was hoping you could talk about the specific activities that OMB is working on to advance data disaggregation efforts for AA and HPI. So thanks so much, Erica, and just wanted to say thanks for including me in this discussion and launch today. It's just, it's an honor to be here and to be a part of this work. Um, so as you know, the administration has made equity a central priority in its policies and vision for how government agencies can evolve and reduce systemic barriers that different communities face. OMB, where I sit, has been really proud and committed to being a part of this whole of government effort. A uh, central pillar of a more equitable government is developing the policies and the infrastructure for equitable data. Good data is critical to good policy, particularly when it comes to reaching underserved communities and reducing systemic barriers that communities might face. So early on, the Equitable Data Working Group, which OMB co-chaired, met with stakeholders who emphatically stated that many individuals, including in particular subgroups of Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders, are not represented in the current minimal, minimum racial and ethnic categories. 
leaving them unseen in government statistics and masking important differences and inequities. So that's why in April, this working group released its publicly available report. It's called Vision for Equitable Data, and it identified a number of recommendations for OMB to ensure historically underserved populations are empowered by and benefit from federal data, surveys, and equity assessments, and that the federal data system supports desegregation directly or through statistical estimates. This is really about being seen, uh, seen and heard. So OMB's work to realize this vision for equitable data is moving full steam ahead through two big initiatives. First, within OMB, we're working to update something called the Statistical Policy Directive Number 15. Uh, so we sometimes call it SPD Number 15. And that's the, those are the standards for maintaining, collecting, and presenting federal data on race and ethnicity for all of government. And so I'll discuss that a little bit uh, later in this uh, session. But so we are also excited to co-chair along with the Office of Science and Technology Policy and other colleagues, an interagency committee that will continue the broader push towards embedding equitable data practices in the federal government. And lastly, we facilitated the administration's equity efforts more broadly. And we're helping agencies prioritize investments in equitable data through their budgets. So for example, in FY23, which is fiscal year 23, we requested funding from Congress to help agencies disaggregate their data about applicants and beneficiaries to share as to social programs. We also requested resources for the National Center for Health Statistics to increase the size of their signature survey so that they can better describe health outcomes for small NHPI and SOGI communities. And we added funding to the Department of Justice to increase understanding of crime, victimization, and historically underserved communities including the AANHPI communities. Thanks, Erica. Thank you so much. This is extraordinary work. And it's all, again, we don't do it alone. It, it's across all agencies and a, and a whole of government effort. Grateful for your leadership there. Um, Mr. Bain, the White House Domestic Policy Council is charged with driving the development and implementation of the president's domestic policy agenda in the White House and across the federal government. We are so grateful for your partnership with both myself and our office and the White House Initiative on ANHP to prioritize and coordinate the interagency implementation of Executive Order 1403, one to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for AANHPI communities. How does the release of today's national strategy for AANHPI communities factor into the Biden-Harris administration's ongoing efforts to advance racial equity overall? Well, thanks for the question, Erica, and thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with you and with Nani because our offices work so closely together to advance the president's prioritization of equity across the administration. That began on day one of the administration. Actually, the first executive order the president signed was a historic whole of government executive order directing every agency to advance equity for underserved communities. That means through all federal programs, on all policies, all activities of agencies. And it focused on, as I said, underserved communities, communities who have for too long not have a had equal access to government programs and benefits, uh, face barriers to avail themselves of the resources that the government makes available. Uh, I'm talking about people of color, including AA and NHPI communities, Americans with disabilities, LGBTQI plus Americans, religious minorities, people who live in rural communities, communities facing persistent poverty and inequality and others. Uh, you know, we need to acknowledge that the federal government has played a role in erecting barriers over the years to accessing our programs and our policies and our benefits. Uh, and we thereby bear a responsibility to, to take down those barriers. And the president sent that message loud and clear on the first day. Uh, that order recognized that we've got this ideal of equal opportunity. It is the bedrock of American democracy. We, you know, the president often talks about this is the only country built on an idea. And right? it's not about one group of people. It's not about a certain race or ethnicity or religion. It's built on an idea that all people are created equal and everybody has equal opportunity. Um, and as the president also has often said, you know, we've, we've never fully lived up to that ideal, but we've also never fully walked away from it. And what he's done with this day one executive order and with the executive orders that followed, including 14031, is to put the full weight of the federal government behind that ideal of equal opportunity. So 
Uh, I see these executive orders as deeply connected. It's why DPC works so closely with WeOnP, the White House Initiative, and with OMB and other counterparts across the administration. Uh, 14031, it reestablished WeOnP. It, it, uh, it also has reestablished the President's Advisory Commission on AA and NHPIs. And it really gave a mandate to try to use all of the levers of government to make sure there's full inclusion for all Americans, including AA and NHPI communities. The national strategy that is being released directly contributes to the overall equity goals of the administration. It's going to help agencies deliver on that promise of equal opportunity and equity for everyone in America. Um, and it complements strategies that came out earlier uh, that under the first, the day one executive order, that executive order on equity, over 90 federal agencies issued equity action plans that contained more than 300 specific commitments that each agency was going to take in order to advance equity for underserved communities. Uh, this strategy dovetails with that one. It, it'll allow us to increase our work, to increase the effectiveness, and just do government better. At the end of the, end of the day, this is about mission delivery. delivery. Are we serving the American people? I also want to say that the work on AA and HPIs to, to advance equity for AA and HPIs has been also happening through our uh, major legislative achievements. Just to give you an example, a huge priority for the White House initiative is increasing language access. Uh, and this is something that we began early on in the administration with the implementation of the American Rescue Plan. Many agencies went above and beyond what they've historically done on translation for program administration and to make sure that opportunities for funding were available in languages other than English, including many Asian languages. Um, and this is true for key programs at HHS in particular, just to give an example, as well as the Pilot Community Navigators Program at SBA, the Small Business Administration, uh, that translated materials into the 10 most commonly spoken languages. So I'm excited about the national strategy. It's going to produce more. Uh, we are eager to see how it is going to advance language access, procurement opportunities for AA and NHPI communities, the disaggregated data that Nani talked about. Um, this, stra this strategy is going to help us advance our equity work. Back over to you, Erica. Thanks so much, Rog. Um, and you're right. I mean, this comes from the top. And for those of you in the audience, so when we talk about executive orders, these aren't just acronyms and numbers. These are the commands of the president to us in the agencies um, and throughout the White House. Um, and, and so it is, it is basically our mission orientation. It's our North Star. It is the thing that we censor our work around. Um, and so, again, um, thanks so much for your leadership of partnership, Trog. Nani. Let me circle back to data, not just because I know how much you love data and you, I mean, in the years that I've known and worked for you and with you, I know that data drives a lot of the way you look at the world and the way you look at people, um, because it's not just about numbers, it represents people, the people who, the policies that Trog spoke about, who are central to the impacts and accessibility of our programs and policies and investments. Like Trog said, it's our mission delivery kind of mandate. And um, when we look at data, we see, we see people, um, and these are sometimes underserved people, undercounted people, and sometimes unseen people. And as you mentioned um, in your opening, OMB Co-Chair's Equitable Data Working Group was established by the President's Day One Equity Order that Chirag talks about, and it sought to advance the data equity and improve outcomes for these under his, this historically underserved communities. And earlier this year, the Working Group released a report and recommendations. You ran through some of those, but I was wondering if you could please share some of those recommendations as well as almost equally important, the next steps. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, no, I'd love to talk about data. So thank you, uh, Erica. Uh, so as I mentioned before, and you just mentioned again, um, this data working group released its publicly available report, Vision for Equitable Data. And um, I want to say a little bit more about one of the main things in this report, which is revising the government-wide race and ethnicity statistical standards. So this is important. It's going to drive how all of government collects data. It's going to take a minute. It's going to take a little bit of time here to do that because um, it's very important. And, um, you know, we are actually doing a very um, engaging process to do that. So back in June, uh, we appointed the chief statistician, President Biden appointed the chief statistician of the United States, Dr. Karen Burgess. 
And Dr. Orbis committed to making this revision. It's again called SPD 15. Uh, and, it, and she started convening an interagency technical group back in July. That is a technical uh, group made up of career staff representing over 20 agencies across the federal government. So this working group is now developing recommendations on a number of topics, like whether to change the minimum reporting categories, how best to address detailed race and ethnicity groups in the standards, and how to update instructions for respondents and a number of other important questions. And so back in August, Dr. Or Orbis also announced opportunities for organizations and members of the public to engage directly with this working group. And we posted to date seven listening sessions with interested parties, and we're in the process of scheduling a dozen more. And so the working group will publish its proposal for revising SPD 15 for public comment. And that will open up even more opportunities for engagement. So after considering the recommendations of this working group and public input, Dr. Orvis will deliver recommendations to OMB leadership. And that the goal is to complete the revision of SPD 15 no later than the summer of 2024. Um, so the equitable data working groups report also identifies additional measures OMB could undertake to support the federal government in disaggregating data right now, like disaggregating federal statistics. And our teams at OMB are continuing to explore all of these recommendations. Thanks so much, Nani. I mean, and also for lifting up the opportunity to invite our stakeholders to inform us, um, because I think that a large part of the first year of the performance under the Equitable Data Working Group was listening and learning. Um, and now we're processing and putting it into action. Um, and and I'm very excited to to continue this work with y'all about it. Um, Chirag, um, in the vein of listening and learning from our stakeholders and our, our people across the nation, I want to pivot for a moment. Um, it's a nationwide scourge, but for the Asian American Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities in particular, the thing that is top of mind that as I travel through the nation or sit on Zoom calls, um, people are are very worried about um, the safety of of our in, individuals, families, and communities. And I think in response to this, the White House Domestic Policy Council held a historic United We Stand Summit to highlight the president's continued commitment to promoting belonging, safety, and inclusion for all communities, including the Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders. Could you share some of the key deliverables from that summit and how that could impact AAN and HPI communities who've been impacted by xenophobia and hate and violence? Yes, I'd, I'd be happy to. And I'm just going to take a step back here, Erica, and make sure everyone understands what this was. This, this was a major summit that the president held called the United We Stand Summit at the White House. Its purpose was to counter the corrosive effects of hate-fueled violence. And, you know, this is the issue that drove President Biden to seek the presidency. You know, when he saw white nationalists marching with torches in the streets of Charlottesville, and when the former president responded by saying that he thought there were five people on both sides, President Biden felt compelled to enter the race. And this scourge, your word, that's, that's the right word, this scourge of rising hate fueled violence has been particularly acute for Asian Americans and NHPIs during the pandemic. The FBI documented a 77% increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans in 2020 over the previous year. Uh, and the messaging coming out of the White House at that time was hurting, not helping. And, and I will just say that those figures, you know, that figure 77%, it, it doesn't actually capture the devastating impact that hate fuel violence uh, and, and hate incidents have on A and NHPI communities and anyone who's targeted. You know, we've lost grandparents, uh, you know, sisters, brothers, children, and elders uh, to this violence. People are afraid to go to school, to take public transit, to leave the house. Businesses have been vandalized. This is why the president in his first week of office signed a presidential memorandum directing every agency to combat the scourge uh, and the resurgence of xenophobia. It's also why he signed the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act that gave us new resources and new prioritization to fight back against hate crimes and reduce that kind of violence. Uh, and now I also wanna say this isn't new. Anti-Asian uh, violence is not new. For centuries, Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, 
Hawaiians, Pacific, Pacific Islanders, which are diverse and vibrant communities, have helped build this country, but uh, have been uh, abused you know, throughout history. And this is true of many people of color and religious minorities and other groups in America. You know, they're considered the other and then attacks for being the other, attacks on Chinese American miners and uh, railroad workers in the 1800s, on Japanese Americans in World, uh, World War II, uh, the murder of Vincent Chin in 1982, the post 9-11 violence we saw against South Asians and Muslims, and more recently, the attack on the Gurdwara in Oak Creek uh, that took seven lives, and the horrific spa attacks in Atlanta just last year that really shook the nation. And uh, I think created a new call to action to fight racism and misogyny and all forms of hate. These are the impetuses for the uh, summit. It touches so many communities, right? There's a through line that the president has spoken about that, had, that, that goes from massacres of indigenous people to the original sl sin of slavery, the terror of the clad, anti-immigrant violence, and the more recent violence we're seeing. And so the president called the summit to send the unmistakable message that hate-fueled violence must not have safe harbor in America. And, and we heard from people who themselves have experienced that kind of violence and who are rebuilding their communities. Uh, just to give you one example, Vilma Kari is a Filipino woman who was attacked on the street in New York City. You might have seen the video uh, of a doorman closing the door while the attack proceeded rather than going to help her. She came and spoke at the summit. She's not a professional public speaker. In fact, this was the first time she had spoken about the incident in a public forum, and it was incredibly moving. So yes, the purpose of the summit was to hear directly from people about what they've experienced and how they're rebuilding their communities and to honor people who are building unity. That's a prevention strategy. When we see ourselves in each other uh, and realize we're really all in this together, we are less likely to see that kind of antagonism and violence. Um, and yes, there were specific policies that were announced and deliverables. Just to give you a few examples, we announced, the president announced the White House initiative on hate-motivated violence that would be launched. This is to ensure interagency coordination, leverage federal resources, provide guidance, uh, and prevent this kind of hate-fueled violence. Uh, there's a new United Against Hate initiative launched by the Justice Department, which is aimed to improve coordination and hate crimes reporting between community members and the Justice Department. Uh, we announced new resources through the arts, the National Endowments for the Arts and Humanities to help communities rebuild and bounce back after this, um, have this kind of violence, that resilience is important, you know, coming together. The president also called for new resources for prevention, new investments in civic education and national service. And he announced several external deliverables, over a billion dollars in new funding from philanthropy uh, that came together at the same time of the summit and an agreement from now over 150 mayors to prioritize this work at the local level. So uh, there's much more than that. And I would urge anybody who's interested in this work to go to unitedwestand.gov to be part of it. Thanks so much for recapping that. I mean, amazingly moving. I think um, a lot of folks reflected uh, after the summit that it was transformative for them. And also to see that they are not alone. You know, people suffer in isolation and a lot of fear, and to know that we're united together and that we are not just announcing a summit and holding a summit and announcing accomplishments, but working forward gives, I think, a lot of people a spark of hope that was so desperately needed. Um, and I'm excited to continue that work. It's a lot of work. It's important work. Um, and I'm glad to be in it with you. So on that more positive note, kind of wanted to close out this discussion with a little snapshot of what you each are working on at this moment that most excites you and that you believe will make the lasting impact on AA and NHPI communities. Nadia, over to you. Thanks, Erica. Um, this is just so great to hear, um, Gerard. Everything that you're talking about is really amazing. Um, there's one thing that you mentioned that OMB is really taking a great uh, big part role in and really is exciting uh, for me to, to see how that work is unfolding, which is the equity plans agencies developing their first ever equity action plans. This is over 90 agencies releasing plans. You can find them on performance.gov if you want to see what's in them. But they really address a lot of critical policy areas, economic justice, educational equity, health equity, criminal justice, and more. And OMB will continue to work with agencies to help 
implement these actions, things like expanding access to financing for affordable housing and small business growth, assessing and rectifying past environmental harms inflicted on communities, developing inclusive engagement approaches and materials to ensure cultural accessibility and improve trust in government, and strengthening access to voting by enhancing election resources to better serve voters with disabilities and language minority voters, and also just reinvigorating civil rights enforcement actions. So this has been fantastic uh, to see this come about and just really excited to be working on it. Thank you so much, Tommy. Shrag, what's exciting for you? It should excite the rest of us too. Oh, so, so much, Erica. I'm going to give you a few things here to this question. One, just to follow up on uh, what I told everyone about the United We Stand Summit. Uh, there is a, a, a new external effort that has launched post-summit called Dignity.us. That's Dignity.us. This is something that anyone can be a part of. It's a citizen's initiative to address hate-fueled violence in America. It's convened by the former Domestic Policy Council directors of both Republican and Democratic presidential administrations, and it has the support of presidential libraries and foundations, again, from presidents of both parties. And it's engaging in a listening tour. It's looking for what is working on the ground in local communities to prevent violence and to build unity. Uh, and we need people's expertise. So I would ask for anybody who's interested to please go to dignity.us and be part of it. Uh, the second thing is we're doing a lot of work to address the racial wealth gap in America. One way we're doing that is by directing the federal spend toward uh, small disadvantaged businesses, including those that are owned by AA and NHPI individuals. The federal government is because of the president's leadership who set a goal of increasing this uh, amount, going to achieve a 50% increase by 2025 in the amount of federal procurement dollars, that's federal contracting, that goes to small disadvantaged businesses. $600 billion a year and a 5% increase, that is a 50% increase from 10% to 15%, which is our goal, means another $100 billion. That's a lot of entrepreneurs who can be helped. A lot of people can be part of the federal procurement system. Lastly, I'll just say we're doing a lot of work internally here in government, again, with ours, uh, with OIB, Nadia and her team, and with you and with others to make sure that the federal workforce reflects the diversity of America. That includes AA and HGIs. Uh, I think when we reflect the diversity of America, we get better government. You know, our policies also reflect the best ideas and expertise of our nation. And we are gonna continue that work throughout the administration. Well, I'm excited. Thank you. Shrog, thank you for discussing with us the White House Domestic Policy Council's mission in centering equity and promoting belonging and anti-violence and hate uh, on behalf of every American and on behalf of all Asian American and Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities. Nadia Claretti, thank you for informing us about how OMB is working to advance justice, equity, and opportunity for AN and HPI communities with the White House. It's truly an honor to work alongside great leaders like you to create the lasting change throughout the federal government that truly benefit our AN and HPI communities. Thank you again for joining us today. Well, thank you everyone for joining and thank you so much to this incredible group of panelists um, who we look forward to uh, engaging in a great discussion. Um, and thank you so much to Crystal uh, for her leadership uh, in the White House for all of these issues that are so important, not only to this community, but to the country. Um, I'm pleased to moderate our next discussion uh, with amazing and esteemed federal agency leaders who will discuss the Biden-Harris administration's national strategy to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Island Fair communities. My name is Dan Ko. I am the Deputy Cabinet Secretary at the White House, formerly the Chief of Staff at the Department of Labor that Julie and I might want to talk about a little bit more later in the program. Um, so Julie Sue is the department's uh, is the Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor, where she oversees the department's workforce, manages its budget, and executes the priorities of the Secretary of Labor. John Tian is the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He is the first Asian American in history to be confirmed in this role, where he manages the day-to-day -day operations department responsible for counterterrorism, cybersecurity, economic security, border security, disaster response, and protection against chemical, biological, and nuclear threats to the whole land. So he's a little busy. Um, 
maybe, maybe second only to Vanita Gupta, who is the 19th United States Associate Attorney General and serves as the third ranking official at the Department of Justice, where she supervises multiple litigating divisions within the Department of Justice, including the Civil Division, Civil Rights Division, Antitrust Division, Tax Division, and Environmental and Natural Resources Division. So I'm Associate Attorney General Gupta, Deputy Secretary of CIA, Deputy Secretary of Sue, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join today. Uh, my first question will go to Deputy Secretary Sue. Uh, from day one, this administration has elevated data disaggregation as a racial equity issue across the federal government. Could you share some of the work the Department of Labor is doing to provide a more accurate picture of diverse AA and MHPI communities and to ensure that federal programs and resources are getting the communities, getting to the communities most of it? Thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, so data disaggregation is absolutely an equity issue. My first job uh, was at an AANHPI civil rights organization where I worked for 17 years. And I saw firsthand that um, something that those of us in the AANHPI community know really well, which is that if you don't disaggregate, then disparities experienced by specific AANHPI ethnic communities are masked and um, rendered invisible. And when that's the case, then it becomes impossible to address uh, the very real employment, income, health, education, housing, civil rights, and other, um, other needs of, of the community. Um, and so at the Department of Labor, we have been really committed to that disaggregation. For example, until now, the monthly labor market information that's put out basically about the health of our economy, how are various communities doing, how much unemployment is there, how much employment, labor market participation, all these other things are, were only, um, uh, were only published uh, as an aggregate for Asian Americans. And now um, I'm really proud to say that just since uh, last month, since September, our Bureau of Labor Statistics is publishing for the first time ever monthly labor force estimates for the native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander communities. Um, and this matters a great deal, right? For example, once we started to do that, we knew, we found that the jobless rate for native Hawaiians and other Pacific Islanders was 14.6% in November, 2020, almost um, about nine months into the COVID pandemic. And that was double the rate for the total population. So again, understanding just what's happening in specific communities is so, so critical to addressing community needs. And um, that's true across a whole range of our work from labor law enforcement and wage theft and health and safety and access to retirement benefits and the like. That's incredible. I mean, you can't take action on something that you can't measure. And what's so fascinating about what you said, and thank you for your leadership, but there's like Sue on that, um, is that, that that information existed, didn't exist on paper, but it was there in the communities. Right. And now that you're able to diagnose the problem, you're able to address it in a way that never was able to just because the uh, initiative at the federal government may not have been there to be able to do it. So it's incredible and historic that we have that information and so important to the community to be able to disaggregate that because like we all know in this call that the Asian American community is often aggregated into one and that, that couldn't be further from the truth. It's actually incredibly diverse. And so um, for DepSec Jan and uh, Associate Attorney General Gupta, you know, DOJ and DHS have also played a key role in preventing and addressing hate violence targeting diverse NA and NHPI communities, especially during the most recent wave of anti-Asian hate that emerged during the pandemic that still really hasn't toned down since. Um, could, could both of you share efforts uh, that your agency is undertaking both now and in the coming year to promote safety and longing for NA and NHPI communities? Let's start with Deputy Secretary Jan. Sure. Thanks very much. I appreciate that, Dan. And thanks for uh, hosting us. You know, I'll, I'll actually start off with something that we did in partnership with uh, the Department of Justice uh, here at the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, so we have obviously a, a couple of different to with eight really major different components here in the Department of Homeland Security. One of them is our cybersecurity uh, and infrastructure security agency, better known as CISA. And uh, one of our DHS headquarters offices uh, is the policy shop, which houses something called the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships, better known as CP3. And in partnership with the Federal Bureau of, of Investigation, the FBI over DOJ, and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, 
we hosted the AAPI Hometown Security Series. Uh, it was at Georgia. It was a webinar to actually explore the concerns of AA and NHPI communities uh, regarding targeted violence and gaps uh, in hate crime reporting, which is really important. I think all of us know and appreciate that. Julie just talked about uh, data. Uh, and also, we need to understand what's actually happening out there so that we can do the analysis and move towards uh, prevention uh, and or potentially uh, prosecution where appropriate. Uh, now, on the one-year anniversary of uh, the, the Atlanta spa shootings, and by the way, I'm actually from Atlanta, Georgia. That's my current hometown. Uh, and, uh, you know, where I moved from Atlanta to D.C. a year and a half ago to, to take this job on, we participated, CP3 in particular, again, that's the uh, Centers for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. We participated in seven White House um, AA and HPI regional network of virtual roundtables that were really focused on combating anti-Asian hate. I think those are super important uh, so that the communities out there understand uh, that there is a community, that there is support uh, here in Washington, D.C. within the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, that's just within CISA and within CP3. There's all of our components uh, do various things to help make sure that AA and NHPI communities aren't being unfairly targeted. I'll give one really good example then, you know, Vanita, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, TSA, many of you know them as a TSA, it's the Transportation Security Agency. Uh, we've always uh, provided training to our workforce to make sure that we're being fair and just in, in the way we do screening and engagement with diverse traveler populations. Uh, in particular, our trainings have extended to now cover understanding the communities, the Muslim, Sikh, South Asian, uh, uh, Buddhist, Hindu communities, and especially in light of, and Dan, you mentioned it, the COVID-19 bias and all of the aggression that we've seen over the past two years to these communities even more important now for us to understand how to engage with these communities as they move through our airports in particular. Uh, and so we do quite a bit of scenario-based training and um, understanding the way we should and can be doing that screening. Uh, Vanita, over to you. Right. Um, and let me just say, I'm always excited to be in conversation with my friends and amazing leaders, um, John and Julie here uh, at the federal government. First, I just want to reiterate uh, what I think we is a commonly uh, held precept, but bears mentioning again that nobody in our society should fear violence. Um, hate crimes instill fear it, across entire communities and really undermine the very principles that our democracy stands on. And the Department of Justice is committed to eliminating hate crimes and incidents so we use our criminal enforcement authority to prosecute those who actually commit these crimes. Um, since January of 2021, the department's charged more than 55 defendants in over 45 cases and obtained over 50 convictions of defendants that were charged with hate uh, uh, bias motivated crimes. One example that I know some of you may have heard of, um, uh, but in August, a man in Texas was sentenced to 25 years on hate crimes charges for attacking an Asian family that he believed was Chinese and said was responsible for the COVID-19 pandemic. In March of 2020, this uh, gentleman uh, approached a family in a store and attacked a father and two children with a knife. He flashed the face of a six-year-old child just millimeters away from the child's eye and stabbed an employee uh, who was trying to stop the attack. This is um, this prosecution uh, function that we play here at the Department of Justice is really important, especially in light of the surge of anti-Asian hate crimes. But we all know that uh, prosecutions are not the fundamental answer to addressing hate in our communities. And so we've got to take a proactive and comprehensive approach to fighting hate crimes, which is why we are using all of our tools and working across the department, but also across the federal government, as John Wright with Philly pointed out to combat hate and ensure that our communities are safe. One of his, as one of his first acts in office, the attorney general actually directed an expedited review to determine how the department could improve its efforts to combat unlawful acts of hate. Uh, and while that review was actually nearing completion, Congress passed and the president then signed into law the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act and Jabara Hire No Hate Act. Uh, DepSec Tian was just talking about the need for better data um, uh, following what Deputy Secretary Sue was talking about. We don't have good enough data and good enough reporting. And sometimes uh, the kind of trust that we need in communities around the country 
for vulnerable victims to contact law enforcement and to report these crimes. But as a result of the passage of this legislation, the department was able to enhance its efforts to combat unlawful acts of hate, improving incident reporting, increasing law enforcement training and coordination at all levels of government, prioritizing community outreach and making better use of our civil enforcement mechanisms. And in May, the department also issued guidance with HHS aimed at raising awareness of hate crimes during the pandemic. The guidance provides an overview of the rise of hate crimes and hate incidents during the pandemic, specifically highlighting the sharp increase of incidents targeting the AA and HPI communities. But it also outlines several steps that law enforcement, government officials, and others can take uh, around to raise awareness of the increase in hate crimes, but also how this increased awareness can be used for prevention of and response to hate crimes. The department's just awarded $20 million of grants to support law enforcement agencies and community-based organizations that are working to combat hate. We're really excited that we're going to be able to announce uh, uh, new grants under the Jabir Hire No Hate Act that uh, creates funding for hotlines to report hate crimes and incidents to really increase that level of reporting so that we know where the problems are and what more we need to do to address it. Thank you for that overview. To both of you, it's so important. And the Service of Attorney General, one of the things that you said it really resonated with me, I think resonates with the community is, is that aspect of building that trust, right? Being able to create the outlets in which people can come forward and can report these things that I think historically weren't as robust and therefore that trust hadn't been built. And so I would imagine that a lot of the work that the Department of Justice is doing will pay dividends, cumulative dividends over time because that trust tree is really being built in a way that maybe necessary, maybe potentially didn't exist before. Uh, and, and on that theme, uh, you know, not just the geographical diversity of the Asian, Asian uh, community, the Asian American community here, to the United States, but the language access therein is also a very important point here. So this is for the panel and whoever uh, would like to speak on it first, please chime in. But, you know, language access continues to be a key priority for the community. And we know that having information in language can really make the difference between life and death. And we all know stories of people who had trouble with all different aspects, voting, what have you, access to healthcare because of language barriers. Uh, could you talk about how your agencies are prioritizing the language needs of diverse populations to ensure that limited English proficient communities have meaningful access to your agency's programs and services, especially during times of crisis. Julie, I see you're ready to chime. I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to jump in. Um, so I, I think a, a very common experience for, um, for Asian Americans uh, is when we are either, um, you know, the, the, the children of immigrants or we grew up in, in, in immigrant communities we learn the importance of translation, right? We grow up translating for our parents. We grow up navigating the adult world and adult interactions from a young age. And I just think, you know, we're really, this administration is so committed to um, making sure that we are um, accessible to the communities that we serve. And so we really look at the rich diversity within the AANHPI community, not as a kind of a, a barrier, um, but an opportunity and ability to like reflect um, that rich diversity through language access is just so, so, so important. Um, and so within, you know, the area of workers' rights, language access is worker equity. Um, there are uh, over 14 million workers who identify as limited English proficient uh, throughout the country. And, um, you know, data and experience and common sense suggest that Many of these workers experience higher, um, uh, they're more vulnerable in their workplace, right? Higher rates of, of wage theft. Um, they are less uh, likely to know about their rights in the workplace. They're less likely to, to work in workplaces that have a health and safety program, for example. And so at the Department of Labor, we take this really seriously. Um, I, you know, we say into all the time, if, you, if, if uh, people can't communicate with their government, then government needs to do better. So we have um, really committed to providing in-language services. Like we have a, um, a hotline, a telephone line for um, people who have questions about um, health insurance and retirement uh, benefits. And that hotline is now in multiple languages that includes Mandarin, Cantonese, Vietnamese, Korean, 
and Tagalog. And again, there's more work to be done, um, but the beginnings of providing true language access, um, I think are just uh, incredibly important. Um, our agency is also in the process now of identifying all of the key, the, the most important um, documents and sources of information that um, people rely on, uh, including information on our website. And um, over this next year, we're going to be providing more language translations into multiple different Asian languages. And these things translate into, you know, real, whether, whether workers can speak out and make a report if they're being cheated in their workplace, whether they can understand, um, you know, things like fall protection, um, you know, COVID-19 um, uh, protocols in the workplace. So they translate to very real um, uh, changes for, for working people when they know um, what, they're, what they're entitled to. So, Sitra, Lutta? Sure, yeah. And just building off on what Deputy Secretary Sue was talking about, I mean, language access can be the difference, as you said, um, Daniel, between life and death and being able to access you know, uh, public safety um, professionals if something is, is going wrong, being able to access any type of programs and benefits. In uh, the Department of Justice's strategic plan, the Attorney General announced earlier this year that the department was committed to expanding language access. And in line with this initiative, we just hired our uh, the first department-wide uh, language access coordinator that the Justice Department has ever had. Uh, the coordinator will actually sit in the Office for Access to Justice, which we reestablished in May of 21, 2021. Uh, and that has really expand, allowed us to expand our language access teams in each of our components. And uh, this person is now leading the department's language access working group to provide technical assistance and training across the department components as we all continue to try to improve language access for everyone. It matters in voting. Uh, we are uh, we obviously enforce laws to ensure language access pursuant to our voting rights laws, but um, it matters, as I said, in in the ability to access all types of programs and benefits. And the Civil Rights Division here at the Justice Department will continue to be a resource to our interagency partners who are interested in updating their language access policies and plans and increasing outreach to limited English proficient communities. We're also listening to and learning from our agency partners who've developed and implemented promising practices in the areas of language access and language justice. Uh, and so we're gonna continue to build out our language access team. Uh, and this includes also uh, building it out and in making sure that courts around the country have language access, are giving language access to people who are in uh, and using those courts like immigration courts, of course. And externally, it really means supporting our state and local partners on this mission. Um, we've got information on our website on reporting hate crimes in 24 languages, including 18 of the most frequently spoken AAP and AAPI uh, languages in the United States. So I think we are getting a lot better than where we were. We still have work to do, but we know how uh, incredibly important this issue is for almost everything we do. Thank you. Deputy Secretary Chia. Great, thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Uh, you know, Deputy Secretary Sue really liked how uh, you phrased it and said that uh, we really, if the government is communicating with uh, the people we serve, the uh, citizens of the United States of America, then it's on us as the government uh, to do even better in that regard. And Department of Homeland Security, we totally agree with that, especially when we consider, and this is true certainly for the uh, Department of Labor, Department of Justice, and I would say for the entire federal government, uh, that if you think about uh, all the different things we in the Biden-Harris administration, we in the federal government, we serve the American people. And at least in the, within the Department of Homeland Security, it could be, and I like, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, communication could be a matter of life and death, and it certainly could be a matter of how you live one's lives. And for us, the Department of Homeland Security, we are on a daily basis, sometime hour by hour, we are communicating information about terrorism threats, uh, we're helping people uh, survive uh, disasters, perhaps uh, be resilient before a disaster strike or be in response to a disaster or in our immigration programs, which obviously, you know, has a lot of uh, relevance to uh, any of the diverse com communities to include uh, AA and HPI. Now, uh, Associate Attorney General Gupta just spoke about uh, their, they've designated the leader over Department of Justice in terms of uh, language, uh, you know, access. 
For us, it's been the uh, department's office for civil rights and civil liberties. Uh, they have long led that language access program for the department and what they do is they make sure that all of our components, I mentioned one earlier, uh, TSA, CISA, we have FEMA and you know, uh, USCIS, uh, CPP, all of them have sound language access plans uh, and practices in place. Uh, one example, this is just one example, I know we have a fine amount of time here, Dan, uh, is that our National Terrorism Advisory System, the NTAS, the bulletins are translated in numerous languages. And this is, this is one that goes out far and wide to our state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. Uh, and it's disseminated widely. We want it to be pushed out. Uh, and just as a, for example, our translations include Chinese, both simplified and, and traditional, Korean and Vietnamese, and many, many, many other languages. Some of them actually, uh, the Associate Attorney General just mentioned. You've, uh, we spoke about COVID-19 uh, a little bit already uh, during this uh, webinar. Uh, this is a really good example of, I think, the power of uh, the federal government to be uh, making sure we're setting the exemplar and asking others to follow us, or perhaps even mandating uh, during COVID-19 with our uh, grantees, the uh, HHS, who's not on this call, and DHS, so Health and Human Services, and us for Homeland Security. We issued a joint letter to the states on their language access obligations in providing COVID-19 services. And remember it, we all remember well, testing vaccines treatment to limited English professor persons so they could get the, the right information at the right time in the right places. Um, we have just a few minutes left, in fact, two minutes left, um, but I was wondering if uh, we could go around in maybe 30 seconds each. You know, there's probably many people watching this webinar who um, are interested in getting involved in government, and one day being the the Deputy Secretary Sue or Associate Attorney General Gupta or Deputy Secretary Tienz of the future. And as you know, if you sit and think about all the things that all of you have to overcome to be where you are, it can be a little overwhelming. And so if you put yourself back and maybe, uh, you know, in high school or think about the advice you give yourself there for people who are watching this in the next generation, I'd love your 30 second thoughts on that. Not to put you in the spot, Associate Attorney General Gupta, unless there are. Oh my gosh, this is like a big uh, philosophical question. Well, um, my hope is that um, Deputy, Deputy Secretary Chan, Deputy Secretary Sue, and I can serve as examples of uh, people who, uh, you know, for whom there may not have been anyone who looked like us or came from our backgrounds in our positions. And here we are. Um, there are we are all standing on shoulders of giants who fought to ensure that we have diversity, that we are able to access these high levels of leadership and that we can kind of pass the torch forward. Um, there is, you know, I, I had mentors in my life who made it possible for me to understand that uh, just because maybe no no woman of color had ever been in the top three uh, to in, in, as associate attorney general at the Justice Department didn't mean that um, somebody couldn't be. And I've had a lot of mentors um, help me along the way, but I would also say my parents, uh, when they came to the United States, I don't think ever imagined that their daughter might be in this position, but they believed in me, they believed in education, and they believed in helping um, lift each other up, and in, um, in that public service is truly one of the most patriotic things one can do to give back to what this country had given them. And so my hope is that we can inspire others to follow suit. Uh, even though all of us have very hard days, I don't think there's a day where we question why we do what we do, uh, because public service is just, it, it is incredibly meaningful. Um, and so uh, my hope is that there will be many, many more Asian Americans in these high levels of leadership uh, in the years ahead. Deputy Secretary Chair. And, uh, you know, Dan, you actually uh, were very nice. You spoke about uh, me, and Vanita, and Julie. But uh, there are folks who are going to watch this, and they I hope they do, and they're going to say, and Dan Cohn from the White House, formerly uh, Chief Staff over at Department of Labor. So uh, love what uh, Benita said. I'll, I'll uh, riff a little bit off of that. And I'd say it's really around confidence, uh, capability, uh, and again, love the mentorship piece. So I'll pick up on that. On the, on the confidence piece, uh, one of the things that happens, and I think this is going to change over time, it already is. So we look at this. A webinar. And these, we're not just sort of cherry picked out of this. These are, uh, you know, I don't want to be too self-serving, but these are pretty important positions that we're in. Uh, and uh, we are serving, uh, we have a strong public service ethos, and we're contributing to uh, 
uh, the security and well-being of the United States of America and our fellow citizens. So um, number one is to have the confidence that you do belong. Whether you see it or not, you're seeing four of us here, but whether you see it or not, you absolutely, if you are AA, NH, or PI, that you have the ability to do this and that you have the access to do it, number one. So confidence. Number two, on the capability standpoint, uh, you, and this is, this is go, goes out, and I'm sure all the high school teachers out there will love this, which is it, you've, you've actually got to be pretty proficient at what you do. You have to be capable. It is not just going to be handed to you simply because you are of one particular, you know, ethnic group or uh, diverse group. You have to have that capability. And that's true for all four of us on here. I know you guys get tested in this every single day. I certainly do. Uh, and I'm thankful that over the course of my lifetime that, uh, you know, various folks, various institutions taught me uh, the right way to do things and to be a literally a good student. And then the last piece around the mentorship piece, I, I agree with Vinita. When I was growing up, uh, look, my, my 24 years uh, in the United States Army didn't have a lot of uh, Asian American role models. There were a few here and there, uh, General Rick Shinseki, the first Asian American and really the only Asian American, I think, so far to ever hold uh, the position uh, on the Joint Chiefs as the Army Chief of Staff. I mean, he was a pretty early exemplar. So he was a great exemplar, but not necessarily, I, I had very few uh, Asian American officers or non commissioned officers, or I could look up to. But importantly, uh, to know that sometimes the mentor doesn't necessarily have to be someone who looks like you. Great if they do, uh, or their shared background, but to seek out those mentors and to, to some extent, have that confidence, making sure you have the capability so those mentors take you on, uh, because that's really the pathway quite often to understanding uh, the way the world works. Not necessarily, uh, you know, folks just giving you a leg up simply because. Uh, they know you, but because you've earned it, and because you've shown that you have the confidence to get the job done. Thank you very much. Deputy Secretary Sue, I'll give you the last word. My gosh. Okay. So I definitely think that's, you know, that, that what both Vanita and John said is right about sometimes when you look at people in positions like this, you think that like we've known all along that we were going to do this. And I know that, that, you know, that's not true for, for my friends. It's not true for me. And so maybe a twist on what, um, what, what John just said is that sometimes we have to step into things before we're fully confident to do it, right? To like, you know, to, to you know, push ourselves to, 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 to embrace positions and, and, and opportunities that, that um, you know, make you feel uncomfortable uh, um, at, at, at the outset. Um, I will say that I think one of the greatest things just to not repeat everything that was said is um, to me, being a part of, uh, you know, and, and active in the AANHPI community was really key to my entire journey. And so if I had to say something, I would say that, you know, really embrace that sense of community, you know, find organizations that are working in the community. Um, I would not be in my position had people not pushed for um, an Asian American in, you know, um, at, at the highest levels of government. And that's not something um, that you know, this is something I say a lot because it's something I'm actually very proud of, right? It's a sign of our uh, community's power, of our community's needs, of this administration's willingness to hear that and the need to embrace it, right? I'm so proud to be in the company of Vanita, who's been a hero for so long. John has become just, just such, a, such a good friend. And the ability to be in a community um, is something that I am, you know, incredibly grateful for. And Dan, you know, I feel this about you too. And the fact that you're there in the White House, that we have a a White House senior advisor on AANHPI issues um, in Erica Mortsugu that we have an executive order uh, addressing the issues that that, that we work on, um, where you know Crystal's leadership is so important. You mentioned at the beginning. Yeah, I just think you know recognizing that uh, you know there is a space for us demanding that at at, at the right times. You know, um, you know, uh, you know, forcing ourselves to be uncomfortable um, in order to uh, you know to, to claim our space. I think those are all really important aspects of, of um, being able to, uh, to, to, you know, allow our community to step into the spaces that, that, um, that we should be in. Thank you. And all of your leadership and all your respective ideas are trailblazing in their own ways and uh, really making a huge difference. Again, not only for this generation, but for many generations to come. So thank you all. We know you're very busy. We very much appreciate your time and your service to the administration. Hello, I'm Congress Member Judy Chu, Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, or KPAC. Thank you so much for inviting me to join today's event 
announcing the release of the Biden-Harris administration's annual report and federal agency action plans for advancing equity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. And let me start by recognizing the leadership of my own former staffer, WIAPI's Executive Director, Crystal Kai, for all the work you've done in service of our communities previously at KPAC and here today under the Biden administration. From his very first week in office, when he made addressing anti-Asian hate and COVID-19 health and economic disparities impacting AANHPIs a national priority, President Biden has been a champion for the safety and opportunity of all in our communities. And then, as we commemorated Heritage Month in May 2021, President Biden signed Executive Order 14031 on advancing equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. This act, which established the initiative and the President's Advisory Commission on AANHPIs, also included one more very important section to increase visibility and opportunity for our communities. And that is requiring each agency to prepare a plan outlining measurable actions they are considering to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for Asian Americans and NHPIs. I am so pleased that agencies are releasing plans today to address the key issues that affect our communities, including data disaggregation, language access, workforce diversity, civil rights, and so many more. As chair of KPAC, I applaud the work these agencies have done with our communities in mind. And I urge you all to not only create and release these plans, but to implement them as efficiently and effectively as possible. We in KPAC stand ready to work with all of you towards these goals. I am grateful to President Biden and his administration for addressing the needs of our communities through these actions. And I want to thank the entire WIAPI team for all the work you're doing to advance equity, justice, and opportunity for all of our communities. And thank you again for inviting me to join you today. Mahalo, Congresswoman Judy Chu. Thank you for joining us today and for all of your incredible work in Congress as the chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific American Caucus, as well as your leadership to advocate for our AA and NHPI communities all across the country. I'm now happy to introduce the final part of the program, our community panel. The Biden-Harris administration would not be able to do the work we do without committed AA and NHPI leaders all across the country. Our moderator today will be our Chief Commissioner, Sonal Shaw. I'll turn it over to Sonal to introduce our panelists. Crystal, thank you for your leadership of the White House Initiative on Asian American, Native Hawaiian, and Pacific Islanders. You and your team have been such a pleasure to work with. I am pleased to introduce my colleagues and friends in our community panel today. Um, they represent some of the leading national AA and HPI organizations in our country. And, um, and they're here today to discuss, and we're honored to have them, but they're here to discuss some important issues that our community has been facing over many years. Uh, let me introduce each of our panelists. Uh, we have Greg Orton, the National Director of the National Council of Asian Pacific Americans, an umbrella organization of over 30 groups focused on developing policy and communication strategy to address the needs of the AA and HPI communities. We have Manjusha Gulkarni, co-founder of Stop AAPI Hate and executive director of the AAPI Equity Alliance, a coalition of over 40 community-based organizations that serves and represents the 1.5 million Asian American and Pacific Islanders in Los, in Los Angeles County. We have Estella Owimaja Church, the executive director of Empowering Pacific Islander Communities, a national organization focused on advancing social justice and promoting culture-centered advocacy, leadership development, and research for Pacific Islander communities. We have Kam Mula, the national director of the Southeast Asia Resource Action Center, which is a national civil rights organization that em empowers Cambodian, Laotian, 
and Vietnamese American communities to create a socially just and equitable society. We have Ginny Kim. She is the Vice President of Policy and Programs at the Asian American Advancing Justice, a national civil rights organization that works to advance civil and human rights for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders, and to build and promote a fair and equitable society for all. And we have Chilling Tom, the CEO and President of National Asian Pacific Islander Chamber of Commerce and Entrepreneurship which is a national organization that gives voice to the business interests of AA NHPIs and seeks to improve the economic, political, and social well-being of AA and NHPIs. I am super excited to have all of you on this panel because you represent um, the breadth of our community, but also the diversity of our community and all of the issues that it brings together. So thank you for being here. Um, Manjushi, uh, Manju, I'm going to call you Manju. I'm sorry. I know you as Manju and I know you go by Manjusha, but uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to be a little bit informal on this and say, you know, your organization, Stop API Hate, was formed at the onset of COVID-19 pandemic to better track and respond to xenophobia and harassment targeting AA and HPI communities. What is your organization currently focused on, um, you know, given all of the attention that has been given? And what steps can the federal government take to better support efforts to address incidents of bias and hate targeting our communities? And as you know, this has not stopped since 2020, 2021. While it's not in the public, um, the, the hate continues. Thank you so much, Sonal, for your question and for your leadership on um, we and Oppie, and also to Crystal Aragon, of course, President Biden and Vice President Harris. We issued a report called the Blame Game. Uh, we um, researched um, all of the cases, the 11,000 incident reports uh, made directly to stop API hate over two years and found that over 2,000 involved scapegoating. Um, uh, Congresswoman Chu and Congresswoman Meng uh, joined us to talk about what has been happening in this election cycle, where too often political um, candidates, as well as even elected leaders, have been scapegoating members of our community uh, in terms of public health. Uh, the economy and economic issues and national security. And unfortunately, this type of rhetoric really puts our communities in harm's way. We first saw it, unfortunately, with President Trump blaming um, the Chinese and Asian Americans for COVID, but it continues now. And many candidates have been employing that. Um, and 2,000 plus individuals have suffered harm as a result. Um, what federal government officials can do is, um, you know, to take a public stance uh, when the rhetoric is used and when these actions result in harm uh, to our community members, to acknowledge uh, past government actions as well as current actions um, that uh, profile, uh, surveil, and really uh, wreak havoc on our communities. Uh, we've seen that, unfortunately, too many times in our country's history. Obviously, addressing the root causes and supporting through legislation and resourcing our communities, our Asian American Pacific Islander communities who have suffered during COVID, who have suffered, um, you know, as a result of the economic harm that the disease brought. Manju, thank you so much. And, and for the work that you all are doing, I will definitely check out the report and truly appreciate it. But I think one of the issues that you bring up, and I'm going to bring Greg into this conversation, is when we do reporting and when we collect data, how are we collecting that data? Do we know which communities are being targeted? How um, And how do we make sure of that across the, across the government? So, Greg, for decades, AA and NHPI leaders have urged the federal government to change how data is collected and reported for our diverse communities. And um, can you talk about why this is so important to AA and HPI communities and how NCAPA has been involved with the Biden-Harris administration to promote greater data equity? Sure. Thanks, Sonal. Always good to see you. And uh, echoing thanks to President Biden and his administration for all the work that's been done. Um, you know, when people hear data or policy, oftentimes their eyes will glaze over 
assume that we're about to get wonky. And while I will rep the uh, the policy nerds or the, the data nerds and the policy wonks every time, I'll take a step back and try to frame this from a people perspective. Uh, for a long time in the general public, the term AAPI or AANHPI meant East Asian faces, oftentimes associating it with economic and educational success. Uh, but what our community has known and what we're seeing slow progress with the broader public's understanding is that our community is actually incredibly diverse. Whether you're a South Asian restaurant owner or a Southeast Asian doctor who grew up in a refugee family fleeing war, or a native Hawaiian government official blazing a path for their community, a Pacific Islander musician, even a fourth generation Japanese American whose family story is deeply rooted in American history, or even a Korean American adoptee. All of these are parts of our community. We're not a monolith, and to assume our success is universal invisibilizes the very real struggle of millions of Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Although unfortunately for a long time, the government and the private sector has failed to operationalize this understanding of our community. And as a result, AANHPI data is either collected in the aggregate, which has masked huge disparities across education, health, housing, and income, or even worse, because they assume this flawed narrative of universal success, they don't even collect data on our communities at all. This is what our communities have been working on for all these years. If you ask any corporation or small business, good data analytics are a key to success. Even in sports, data analytics have changed the way teams strategize. For public policy, it's no different. Better data equals better policy. And our communities deserve to be fully accounted for by the government, by businesses, and the public at large. But what is most exciting is that thanks to the leadership of the president, his team, we have a real shot at bringing this issue home. Ambassador Susan Rice at the Domestic Policy Council, Director Shalanda Young at the Office of Management and Budget, the off at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy, as well as others, have all signaled a willingness to advance data equity. In closing, I simply want to reiterate a point that we've consistently made in all of the meetings and engagements on this issue. This is an all-of-government challenge that requires an all-of-government solution. Change on this scale deserves careful, careful deliberation and consideration. But let's be bold. Let's be visionary. Let's set an example for what data equity looks like for our communities. Because for all the justified focus on racial equity, data equity is a necessary first step for racial equity for Asian Americans, Native Hawaiians, and Pacific Islanders. Craig, thank you for that. And thank you for what NCAP has been doing with the administration on ensuring that that, that is included. And Estelle, I'd like to bring you in here because as we talk about data, um, the data shows that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islander communities were disproportionately uh, impacted by COVID-19 crisis and had some of the highest rates of COVID-19 infection and mortality uh, rates of any racial group uh, within the NA, well, altogether, and also amongst the ANHPI communities. Again, showing why data is super important and, and uh, allows us to understand what's actually happening. But sadly, these inequities existed even before COVID. Um, this is not new. Um, this is something that's important we need to address, but it's, it, it's the pandemic that only ex exacerbated um, the numbers and showed what was really happening. So what are some of the biggest challenges uh, currently facing the Pacific Islander community, and how can the federal government um, and the Biden-Harris administration uh, be more helpful? Thank you for that question, and my gratitude to President Biden, Vice President Harris, and the administration for all the work you've been doing. Um, and want to say yes and to everything that Greg said, what he spoke about um, in regards to data disaggregation, yes. So I won't go ahead and, and double down on that, but um, I will say uh, that it's tough to choose a single issue. And I think to do so would actually be a disservice to Native Hawaiian and PI communities, um, Pacific Islander communities. A good friend of mine always says that every issue is a PI issue. And you're right, the disproportionate impact that COVID-19 had on Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities only speaks to um, the disproportionate impact of other issues on our community prior to the pandemic. Um, but it also points out a need for an intersectional uh, racial equality approach um, or racial equity approach to these issues. 
Um, and it also speaks to a traditional lack of investment in Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities specifically. Um, and um, there, in, in addition to greater efforts or further efforts around data disaggregation and the way that data is collected and the way that data is analyzed afterwards, um, there's got to be a holistic, intersectional, community-based, culturally responsive um, way to approach or find solutions uh, for issues around early education, college career pathways, access to healthcare, language access, um, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, part of the reason why COVID-19 disproportionately caused so much harm to Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander communities is because of a historic lack of access to adequate health care and um, the rate of comorbidities amongst our communities. Um, and so if we're able to create and invest in solutions that, that build up communities of care, then um, we can we can hopefully find uh, some approaches that are not only intersectional, um, but that are absolutely community-based. Um, and then I, I'd say we, we wanna make sure that we're always keeping in mind that even within just the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander community, our communities are as vast as the oceans where our ancestors came from. And so um, when dealing with each of our, our respective groups, um, there has to be a community-based, culturally responsive approach. Thank you, Estella. And that's a good reminder that it's not just about the data, but it's also about the culture and the and how how we um, how we see the communities amongst even within a community. There's 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 many layers there. Um, uh, Tom, you know, Greg mentioned this and and said this often, but the, you know, our AA and HPI communities often contend with the model minority. Um, and that assumes that we are all highly educated, economically well off, and don't face the same challenges as other communities of color. But we know that it's not true. We know, um, you, you just heard Estella talk about this a little bit with the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander communities. We know that we Southeast Asian communities also face unique challenges. So how has CRAC engaged with the administration to address concerns of the Southeast, Southeast Asian community? Thank you. And firstly, I want to also thank the president, the administration, and the initiative for inviting us to be here. As Greg mentioned, the model minority myth harms all Asian Americans. It obscures the reality that A and HPI communities are extremely diverse in racial and ethnic identity, extremely diverse in socioeconomic level, health outcomes, and migration patterns. Uh, for Southeast Asian refugee communities, struggles with historical trauma, mental health access and academic disparities have left challenges faced by our peoples and our students hidden under that umbrella. And though our communities have made significant strides across the board, the experiences of Southeast Asian refugee communities with war, genocide, and escape from violence have colored their everyday experiences. Although there are a significant number of concerns that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm going to just quickly touch on a few key ones that we work on specifically at CMAC and have talked about with the administration in some form. Um, in the areas of mental health, Southeast Asian refugees experienced immense trauma, grief, and loss in the process of witnessing war, experiencing genocide and displacement. And as such, these populations experience post-traumatic stress disorder at higher rates than the general public. For example, 62% of Cambodian adults experience PTSD compared to about 3% of the general population. And the Hmong community has, is twice as likely to experience some kind of mental health issue, including major depression, PTSD, and other anxiety disorders. This is also important because it runs into our educational work as well. And Given the diversity of outcomes within each Asian group, collecting this disaggregated ethnic data is crucial to revealing the educational disparities across A and HPI subgroups. Um, you know, uh, in our communities, we face significant academic challenges. For example, about 30% of Southeast Asians have not completed high school or passed the GED, a rate that's more than double the national average. Southeast Asians also have lower K-12 and higher education uh, achievement compared to East and South Asians. 
Uh, and, you know, the lack of understanding because of the lack of data has translated to other areas, including in school discipline, where Southeast Asian students are three to five times more likely to receive exclusionary discipline, such as suspensions and expulsions compared to East Asian students. Um, this disproportionately translates to Southeast Asian youth getting caught up in our school to prison pipeline, which is also a major concern given that about 80% of all Southeast Asians who are facing removal today are facing removal because they came into contact with the criminal legal system in some way. So how have we engaged with the administration? You know, we think that this administration has been significantly more receptive to working with our communities and working together with us to find a reasonable solution to many of these concerns. Uh, at CRAC, we appreciate the continuous engagement with the Department of Education to discuss the need to disaggregate student data at the K-12 and higher education levels, including more recent conversations about the need to disaggregate racial and ethnic data uh, in the, FAFSA simpl the sim simplified FAFSA forms. We've also talked with them about the outcomes of the department's Asian American and Pacific Islander data disaggregate disaggregation initiative that began under the Obama administration. And that is a mouthful. And, you know, on, on our end, we've also had the opportunity to meet with the Department, of, uh, the Department of Homeland Security to talk about the impact of deportations on Southeast Asian Americans uh, and the types of mitigating factors that the agency and its agents should take into consideration when they're deciding on their removal operations. And quite frankly, the needs to just end removals um, of our communities. And the last thing is that, you know, get, we are extremely excited about the president's uh, mental health initiatives. And, you know, we hope that, uh, you know, we can continue to expand the conversation and work more closely with SAMHSA and HHS in the coming year to begin conversations about addressing mental health uh, for Southeast Asian communities. Tom, thank you so much. Um, and I think I think there's a lot in there, but I think there's some, well, there's much going on. There's more, always more to do. And I, I appreciate uh, the the vast number of agencies that you are working with. Ginny, um, it is not always just about uh, data disaggregation. It is also about language sometimes. And uh, as you know, many of our AA and HPI communities face language access issues. And AAJC has been working to remove barriers for limited English proficient individuals from accessing their right to vote through voting materials like ballots and registration forms. Can you share with us more about AHAC's efforts to address language access and voter engagement and also other issue areas? Thanks so much, Sonal. And thank you to Crystal and Erica and your leadership and the Biden administration and the active engagement of our communities on these issues. Um, language access is a critical civil rights issue that cross cuts all facets of life for a significant portion of the Asian American community. And we know that two thirds of our community is immigrant and half of immigrant Asian Americans are limited English proficient, meaning about a third of our community um, are LEP. And we know that 92% of our community are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And for those of us who grew up in immigrant families with children often serving as interpreters for their parents, language barriers can impact every aspect of our lives from schools, to doctors, jobs, government services, and to voting. And when it comes to voting, Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act requires jurisdictions hitting certain thresholds of voting age citizens of a single language minority, so that's 5% or 10,000 people in, in, in any given jurisdiction, to provide written materials um, in the covered languages and bilingual poll workers and publicizing the language since it's available. And for Asian languages, there are you know, 32 jurisdictions in 14 states that are covered, covering eight Asian languages. Now, in those places, we work with community partner organizations across the country, both through subgrants, training materials, written materials, and other resources to ensure that the covered jurisdictions are providing the required language assistance. But we also know that Asian American communities exist far and wide beyond these covered jurisdictions. And so we work with local community partners and engaging jurisdictions to voluntarily provide language assistance in voting, especially for those jurisdictions that just missed coverage under Section 203, with populations falling just under 5% or 10,000. So our, our work to ensure Asian Americans can fully participate in our democracy, you know, not only includes working directly with, you know, governments and jurisdictions, but also ensuring 
that our communities and individual members of our communities know their rights through linguistically accessible materials and support. We provide translated elections, fact sheets, checklists, COVID safety guidelines for safe voting, and so much more in 12 Asian languages. And we host the Asian American Voter Hotline in partnership with API Vote, providing live bilingual support leading up to and on election day in nine Asian languages. And beyond voting, we provide linguistically accessible materials and resources, including our hated sins reporting platform that's accessible for, for reporting in language and four languages, as well as our work around census, where translating materials for the census get out the count campaign were available in 23 Asian and Pacific Islander languages. And we all know the vibrant diversity of our community, spanning more than 50 ethnicities, speaking over 100 languages, requires robust governmental engagement. And that means, you know, the advocacy we've been doing with the White House, the Justice Department, and other agencies on language access, including making recommendations for systemic change, you know, beyond the voting area, across different agencies, um, making sure that information about government services, whether it's online or in person and otherwise are accessible to Asian American communities nationwide. And we've seen promising steps from the administration, including the hiring of a language access coordinator for the Department of Justice. And, and we're really looking forward to ensuring that you know, in, as the government rolls out more plans for prioritizing language access, making sure that all of our communities have robust and meaningful access. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate that, and I think it's important. Um, the language access is critical to getting access to a lot of things too. So appreciate that. Uh, so, Chilling, you know, ACE. Um, has been advocating, and I want to go from services to also the small business community, as many in our community, um, our, our small business owners. ACE has been advocating for the needs of the AANHPI small business community, especially through the compounded challenges of, COVID of the COVID-19 pandemic. What are some of the overarching challenges that AANHPI businesses have faced throughout the pandemic? And what are some of the, um, what can the federal government do to support small businesses through programs, partnerships, and policies moving forward um, that can help our communities? Well, first of all, so no, thanks for your leadership and thanks for hosting this very important panel and discussion. Uh, AARHPI small business owners suffer significant loss in business and revenue during the COVID and uh, AARHPI restaurants were especially impacted. I think the top concern and priority for AAHPIs is access to capital. This has always been the reality for minority entrepreneurs, especially AAHPIs entrepreneurs, who often lean into family and personal networks to start or fund their businesses. In our recent survey on trust and access to capital, we found that the majority of AAHPIs lack confidence that they could finance unexpected operating expenses or go after growth opportunities, including contracts, marketing campaigns, or hiring additional workers. The surveys also show that 44% of AAHPIs entrepreneurs lack confidence to fund an unplanned $5,000 business expense. And also they have uh, missed out on relief opportunities during the pandemic because of language barrier, or they did not uh, even know about uh, available resources or didn't think that they are qualified for relief. Another challenge we have discussed earlier is anti-Asian sentiment, even within AANHPR business community. Thanks for Stop AAPI Hate Report. Among 12,000 uh, reported incidents, almost 30% happened in the business place. And National ACE has conducted over 17 business roundtables throughout the country. And the small business owners still talk about uh, uh, the center uh, anti Asian sentiment. In terms of what the federal government can do, of course, awareness of resources and system is very important. 
many of the capital needs that the AARHPI and the minority business could be met by CDFIs or Minority Depository Institute. However, those resources are unfamiliar to our community. Another thing we talked earlier about language and translation service, those are very important. And we have seen very, very good progress within the Biden administration on this front. For example, recently the Small Business Administration began to offer translation service and resources in 10 commonly spoken language other than English. Chilang, thank you so much. And I think, um, uh, you, you, I think I'm glad you were able to bring in the language access and data disaggregation here too, because it's important also for our small business community. Um, all right, this is my favorite part. We're gonna go to uh, rapid response and I'm gonna ask you all one question. And I know this is hard and you're gonna wanna give me a million answers, but you gotta give me 30 second answers on each uh, on this question. Each of you have the same question. What is the most important issue that you would like of the White House Initiative and the President's Advisory Commission on AANHPIs to tackle over the next year? Now I'm going to go right across my screen. So Manju, I'm going to start with you. We would love to have the administration really tackle um, the civil rights issues and develop an infrastructure for dealing with all of the hate incidents. Most of what we're seeing against our communities are not crimes, and therefore we need comprehensive long-term solutions. Come. There are a lot of issues, but we're focused on trying to heal our communities. And to do that, we have to better understand them and make them visible. So data disaggregation. Chilling. A uh, technical assistance programming for AARHPI small businesses and spreading awareness of availability of available resources for AARHPI's entrepreneurs. Estella. Terleva, relationships are absolutely paramount. So continue to dig deep and get to know NHPI leaders and community members. For so long, we've been erased or made invisible. And so now's a great time to, to work with us alongside us. Craig. Yeah, I would co-assign all of my colleagues comments. I would say a catch all for this is, can we fundamentally move the needle with every federal agency in terms of how they view our communities? I think we want to get to a point where their baseline calculus is inclusive of Asian Americans, native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. And Jenny. Ditto to everything all of my esteemed colleagues have said, and also ensuring not only access, but meaningful engagement of Asian American communities, meaning that outreach communities about services available, and also investment in Asian American community organizations so that they have the capacity to both engage with government and also fully serve their communities. I just want to say thank you to all of you. Um, and I know this was a short panel, but the incredible amount of information and the incredible amount of the, the work that you all are doing every single day in, in the communities is so important and so critical. So grateful for your engagement, but also grateful for your engagement with the Biden Biden Harris administration. Um, this is a, you know, obviously it's long term, short term, all of it, but your work is critical to everything that's happening in our community. So thank you so much. And uh, Crystal, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you for your leadership and everything that you have been doing. Uh, what you and Erica have been doing is incredible. So thank you. Thank you to our panelists for sharing your invaluable insights. On behalf of President Biden and Vice President Harris, we appreciate the great work you and your teams do each and every day to support our AA and NHPI communities. We look forward to working with our federal agencies in the months to come to implement their plans. And to our audience, we are so grateful to all of you for tuning in today to hear from our fantastic lineup of leaders from the Biden-Harris administration and our fierce community leaders as part of our launch of this inaugural report. We hope you will take time to read through these plans and provide feedback on ways that we can work more closely together to implement these actions in the months and years ahead. So thank you again. We will provide more information on the next slide on how you can contact the White House Initiative and provide feedback on these agency plans. Thank you again for tuning in today, and I look forward to seeing you at our next VMP event.